Good morning to the online congregation, and I welcome those of you who are new. Good morning to everyone who's here with us in person. Before we get started, I want to share what Sister Patricia put on her envelope. Isaiah 8, 12 through 13. Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord, the Lord of hosts, he shall you hallow. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Honor him. And she put on here, for Jesus Christ is king of kings. Praise the Lord. How powerful. Thank you, Sister Patricia. God bless you. I like that uh, if you look at this, this ties in right to where we're at today, where if you know the truth and you speak out about the truth, you are called a conspiracy theorist. But the Lord says concerning all that this people call a conspiracy. Think about everything our government calls a con They will call me a conspiracy theorist because I speak and teach the truth. That's where we're at today. But we are to put our trust and listen to God, be led by the Holy Spirit, not the government. All right, I'll get off of that soapbox. Uh, I am back on spiritual warfare today. This is part 11, and I am still talking about cleansing your house, demonic attachments, and demonic toys. I started talking about demonic toys last week, and I'm going to finish that up today. Harry Potter collector set, magical minis, wizarding world. And if you can't look at that as a Christian and know what that's all about, you, you must be a baby Christian or you're not saved at all. Let's go to Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14. When you are come into the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God does drive them out from before you. You shall be perfect with the Lord your God. For these nations which you shall possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you so to do. Now, most of the time, when God warned the Israelites not to do something, it was because it was witchcraft, and it was uh, the things that the pagan nations did in worship of the fallen angels. And God did not allow his children, his followers, the Israelites, the Hebrews, to do those things. So he was always warning them, stay out of this, don't do this, don't be like the heathen pagan nations. I want to break this passage of scripture down with the explanation and definitions that John Todd gave. He was very thorough. They threw their children into the fire as sacrifices to Baal, to Molech, or Moloch, and both, all of that is Satan. Our King James Bibles make it sound like the children were able to walk through the fire or to somehow come out, you know, through the other side. That seems to be what's being conveyed, but that is not what it means there at all. They were thrown into that fire. They died in that fire. They were sacrificed in that fire to Satan. Divination is fortune-telling, clairvoyance, wanting to know the future. An observer of times is one who practices astrology. 
That's zodiac signs, horoscopes, believing that the movements and positions of the heavenly bodies tell us what will happen to us on earth. Like a bad omen, ooh, this star is so many degrees north of this star today, and ooh, that's a bad sign. That kind of stuff, okay? An enchanter is a hypnotist. A witch is someone who casts spells on people and controls them with their mind, which is telekinesis. A charmer is a witch of a lesser degree. A consulter of familiar spirits is a medium, someone who asks spirits, that would be demons, to guide them because we are guided by the Holy Spirit, right? So if you're seeking to some spirit to guide you who's not the Holy Spirit, then that's a demon, an evil spirit. A wizard is a male witch. And for those that want to call them warlocks, John Todd said there was no such thing as a warlock. Personally, I refer to those that serve Satan, both males and females, just like male Freemasons and female Freemasons, as witches. I just lump them all in that category as witches. I'm not even trying to make this one was a female, this one was a male. They're all witches. They all serve him. Uh, so that's, how, that's when I'm talking about a witch. I'm not making a distinguishment between a male and a female. I'm not trying to say wizard and witch. I just call them all witches. They're all in witchcraft. A necromancer is a witch that uses familiar spirits to tell the future. But one thing I will say and I'll make clear right now, when they take the time to purposely tell you something is a wizard on a cartoon, on a movie, in a product, you better know full well what they're saying is which. That aligns with the Bible, okay? So we don't have to split hairs about that. That's a witch. That's what they're telling you when they give these things out and they say it's a wizard. As Christians, we are not to be concerned about our horoscopes or believe in zodiac signs. You know how they act like, oh, this one and this one aren't going to get along if two people go on a date. What sign are you? And that kind of a thing. We don't go by that nonsense. Okay? We don't um, worry about what that means for our lives or our compatibility with other people. You know, uh, before my aunt got saved, she always used to try, to, we were both born in January, and she always used to try to tell me, oh, well, you know, we're both, you know, little goats. And so one day I told her, I said, you know, you need to stop saying that about me because I'm not a goat. The goats, guess what? They don't enter in. The sheep do. So <laughs> I was like, I don't have no part of that. You can wear that label on your own self. It don't apply to me. I'm Christian. So anyway, um, we're not to try to pry and find out our future. We're supposed to have peace knowing that our lives are in God's hand. He holds the number of our days. He has good plans for our lives. All of that is up to Him. And we're not trying to poke and pry and go around and figure out what's our future. We just trust Him. That's part of walking by faith. We're not to have anything to do with witchcraft or witches in any way, shape, or form. The collector set said magical minis. And they do not try to hide the typical witch attire at all. You can see the typical witch attire right there in your face. It mentioned wizarding world. And that's all about male witches. But they have both. They have female and male witches that's what they all are in that show, in those books, in those toys, all right? Now, look at this. Let the magic begin. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I hope you have eyes to see this is witchcraft. These are witches and wizards. A sorcerer is a witch. Notice the lightning bolt scar on Harry's forehead. They whipped up a nice little story about someone trying to kill him when he was a baby and he survived and so he wears that little scar as a badge of honor proudly because he was destined for greatness or whatever. Let me tell you what that little star really means. It's a, or that little scar. It's a symbol for Satan. 
It ties into Jesus saying he saw Satan fall as lightning. Find something else to watch. Do not buy this stuff for your children. Don't bring it into your home. If you've got it in there, destroy it and get it out. When you're fascinated with the things of the kingdom of darkness, you will draw the kingdom of darkness to yourself, to your children, into their lives by introducing these wicked things to them. When they're young and when they're small, they look up to their mama and daddy and they do and copy and mimic the things that they do. What are they like? What are they interested in? Okay? So you got to not introduce this stuff into their lives because you're going to give an account for how well you took care of that child that God blessed you with. You're going to be judged for that. If you're on the other side and they're out of your house, ask forgiveness for, you know, a lot of people weren't even saved when they had their kids that whole time. Come to the Lord and acknowledge that, that you failed in that first responsibility that he gave you. Ask his forgiveness and go on and now begin to sow seeds into their lives. It is never too late to speak into their lives. Get rid of all the Harry Potter stuff. It's all about witches. All the books, movies, etc. is glorifying witchcraft. It is a way to groom your children up into witchcraft. For them to easily accept it and dabble in it in the hopes that they will go on with it as they mature. That's what the wicked ones who are working for Satan are hoping when they produce all of this filth is that your children or you will be, in, you know, bewitched by it and accept it all, welcome it in, and even try doing it yourself. They just want to get you in deeper and deeper and deeper. Satan wants to get his grip, his clutches into you as strong as he can. And he's working in many ways, many ways. If you own this stuff, you do have a pact with Satan in your home. He has a legal right to come in and wreak havoc in your life, in your home, in your child's lives. Get rid of toys like snakes and dragons as they represent Satan and his kingdom. And they will draw demons into your child's life. They can have nightmares, they can have interaction with demons, and as I shared last week, they can all of a sudden not be able to speak, not be able to see, not be able to walk, have convulsions, have seizures. There are all kind of ways that Satan can tear you down and your children down. The movie How to Train Your Dragon made things like this little plush toy popular. Even these cute, cuddly baby dragons for babies and toddlers will open doors in your home and in your children's lives. It doesn't matter how cute they are. It's what they stand for. It's what they represent. We let Kennedy get a rubber snake from the gift shop at the zoo one time. It was laying in the living room floor, and I saw our cat looking intently at it one day. She was slowly circling it, and she was on high alert. And as I watched her, the Holy Spirit spoke to me about how it represents Satan, and it has no business being in my home. I got rid of it immediately. Satan deceived Eve in the garden through the use of a serpent. Let's go to Revelation 12:9 talking about serpents and dragons and Satan. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Here we can see that the serpent is forever tied to Satan and so is the dragon. He is called by both and identified by both. I also want to go to Genesis 3, 14 through 15. 
And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, I do want to recognize the Mandela effect in this scripture. It used to say, he, meaning Christ, shall crush your head or will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. Christ has the victory. He will crush Satan's head, has crushed his head already. But at that time, that was prophecy. So through their witchcraft, they have managed to make Scripture now read as if Christ and Satan are equally just bruising each other. Bruise for bruise, and that ain't the way it goes. That's like that little meme I see online where they got Jesus arm wrestling the devil. It ain't even no close competition because Jesus created Satan, and the Creator holds all the power. If you don't know about the Mandela Effect, go and listen to the teachings that I have done on that subject. You can find them on the church website. So God cursed the serpent for his role in the deception because he allowed Satan to use him. He is cursed forever. Once in the Old Testament, God used serpents to carry out his judgment against the people who were complaining against him and Moses. They bit the people. If we are righteous and we stand with God in his judgments, that means that we are also against serpents and we recognize them as cursed. We don't want them as toys or pets or anything else. We certainly do not want them in our homes or in our possession. And the same goes for dragons of any kind. I'm always floored when I talk to people and it doesn't take but a quick conversation to learn and know things about their lives quickly. And like I shared about that homeschool group that Kennedy and I went to one year because she's homeschooled and I thought, okay, this will be a way for her to meet, you know, some of the local kids and m make some friends or whatever. And that, that homeschool group was so filthy. I was floored with the stuff that was going on there. We had a, a lunch meetup one time for the kids to be to socialize, and I was over uh, with one of the moms and her two kids. I sat at their table, and we were talking. She had a little girl with her, and it was more probably about her brother with this particular age group, but the little girl was there with her mom. And as we were talking, this little girl loved dragons, loved everything about them and had all this dragon stuff. And I'm sitting there and the first thing that hit my spirit is, oh no, this family, this home, this little girl has a huge door open to Satan in her life. So I began to speak to the mother and I told her, I said, you know, you know what that means and what that is in scripture. And she was like, yes, but... And, the, and so then the little girl was like, yes, I know, but I still like them. Yes, I know, it's sinful, and I know who it represents, but I still love them, and I'm going to keep them, and my mama is allowing this in, in my life. Because guess what? The mom, that's her home. And she needed to set the example, and she needed to do a deeper teaching and say, you know what? This is bad. You know, we can have other toys, but we don't need this one in our life, in our home. We don't want no chance that something wicked is going to come in because we have this in your room. What you going to do? Who are you going to choose? Jesus or Satan? So... Um, we don't want them in our homes, in our possession. We don't, and, and I will throw this in there too. Once I learned more about the occult 
and the symbolism of the owl and even frogs mentioned in Revelation about those frog demonic spirits coming out of the mouths of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Uh, I, uh, there were three, three that came out. And who was it? Satan himself? I don't remember. Um, I, I don't really care for those or the lizard either. The lizard is so closely to a snake. And so uh, through our toy buying and Kennedy having different toys and stuff, and she's always been one to play outside and play with everything and, and like all the different animals that God has made. Um, sometimes I think it was we had an owl backpack one time and, and different things or a roller bag. So those things that because we're not in the occult, so we don't bow down to Molech in the shape or the form of an owl. We know the owl was a familiar of Athena's. We don't worship them. So those things don't mean those same things to us as Christians, right? But those kind of things I would definitely pray over and cover in the blood of Jesus Christ and use your spiritual eyes and ears. If it's made to look wicked and to look occultish, get it out. Don't compromise. Just say no to it, okay? Be mindful. We have not understood how these things draw demons to them. They do have spiritual significance. They look realistic, like that snake, that rubber snake from the zoo. Uh, these things can confuse our pets because they don't know it's fake. They know these things are dangerous in real life. When my cat was looking at that, she was thinking that was really a snake in our house. And I got the sense that my cat could understand. She could not understand why this dangerous thing was in our home where she was supposed to be safe. And why I was just sitting there like not doing anything about it either, right? We've, we've gotten to a point to where we've got things that look so realistic that actual animals are confused by this stuff when they get around it. And we're not picking up on any of these things spiritually. John Hagee is a false teacher, but I heard him tell a truth one time. He shared about a couple that had brought a statue into their home, and it had a snake wrapped around it. One day they came home to discover a real snake, the exact same kind from the statue, was actually there in their home wrapped around that statue. The wicked statue was a point of contact for Satan's kingdom. And because the people liked it, they bought it, they gave it a place of prominence in their home, it drew the snake and the snake manifested. There was a direct connection, an open door for Satan to work in their home. We must grow spiritually and begin to understand the spirit realm better. That is something that I pray in my prayers all the time. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help you to understand spiritual things better. Get rid of Monster High dolls and clothes. The name says it all. They are chimeras, vampires, zombies, etc. They are creatures of the night, of the kingdom of darkness. I have shared testimonies of what evil toys have said and done with children in the past. Pastor Dauber had shared about a little boy that had a mean-looking doll. And as long as he had it, he was being mean. But when he got rid of it, he quit being mean. It's like there was an immediate change. There are spiritual ramifications going on with these things. The mega corporations are purposely designing the products that they make to get them into your children's lives and open doors to Satan and his kingdom. They serve a different master. And it's up to us to be led by the Holy Spirit and to protect and teach our children about these things. 
You can make it very simple and teach them how bad and evil, mean and wicked toys will draw evil spirits to them. You know, you can just tell your child at whatever level they are at that, you know, if we had this kind of toy, you know, bad things, you might start having bad dreams or scary experiences. Put it simply so that they can understand. You don't have to scare them, but let them understand spiritually that God doesn't want those things in our lives and that bad things can happen if we desire those type of things. Uh, I'm just going to share this right off the top of my head. Uh, earlier, uh, the Holy Spirit was reminding me of something else that Kennedy had gotten. Uh, her her grandma, grandma had given her a Furby one time. And it seemed innocent enough, you know, those little toys talk. And, you know, of course, me, spiritually, I was kind of like, what is a Furby? I was always like, nah, I don't know about this thing. And I always just kind of had that, I didn't have peace about it. And then somewhere along the way, she got another Furby. Maybe that one was from her grandma, too, like a more updated version. And... um I think, if I remember correctly, that Kennedy told me it said something mean one time. Well, I want to tell you something about these toys that they are marketing, especially that little questionable animal, right? It kind of has that little kind of elf troll, you know, kind of thing about it, right? And we already learned that those were demons. So now they make these toys speak, and some of them come with these instructions about what they say and how they act is based on how you treat them. So if you drop them or you shake them, you're going to make them mean and mad, right? So then they're going to be angry and mean and mad to you. You see, can you see how that works? These things speak anyway. So if it's already, you know, an ungodly thing and it talks down the line, it can say anything because a demon can say anything through this toy. This toy might be programmed with so many words or something, but when a demon is in it, it can say anything it wants to. And then when the kid comes and says, this thing called me a name or this thing, you know, said, then the parent can be like, oh, you know, I don't think so. It's not scripted. These are the words that it says. That's not in the list. See, it can go off script when it's demonically empowered. Be mindful. Get your spiritual eyes and ears engaged in this and, and ask the Holy Spirit to start helping you with godly discernment. Okay, so that's just, that's an extra one. I didn't even plan on speaking on that one. Okay, so I want to talk about death for a minute as related to cleaning your house, your physical house. Get skeleton toys, decorations, or anything in your home representing death. Get it out. Because that represents sin, and it draws Satan's kingdom to it. Get cremation ashes out of your home. When you have skeletons and things representing death, the spirit of death will be drawn to it, to that very thing. Death represents sin in Scripture, and death is an enemy. It's an enemy of Jesus, of all Christians, of God's children. We are about life. We are about light. We are not to be about death. As the Roman Catholic Church has taught and uh, taught their parishioners that death is something to embrace that bones and skeletons and skulls and the day of the dead and all of these things are wonderful things that they celebrate embrace and it's part of their belief system uh, i don't think so <laughs> not according to god's holy word get it out get it out jesus defeated death Uh, it's one of the writers in Revelation uh, of the four horses. I believe it was death and Hades followed with it. Hades is hell. Oh, and while I'm talking about that, I did look up about those uh, frog spirits. And it, yeah, I had it right. They come out of the false prophet. 
They come out of the beast, that's the Antichrist. They come out of the dragon, that's Satan. So be mindful about frog toys and stuff too. Let's go to Revelation 1.18. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. So be it. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus defeated hell. He defeated death, hell, and the grave for us. We do not embrace or love things associated with death. But now we have mega corporations marketing death to us in the form of skeleton toys, clothes, and decorations. The world embraces death as something cool. You see skeleton stickers on cars. You even see babies wearing skeleton clothes. You see everybody with skulls and skeleton tattoos on them. These things will draw exactly what it means to it, the spirit of death. Look at your clothes. Go through your closets. Go through your dresser drawers. Anything with skeletons, with zodiac signs, occult pictures, ungodly things on them, destroy it. I had some t-shirts from Cancun, and so there was imagery of sun worship on them. I had some smart aleck t-shirts. Uh, smart aleck t-shirts have become real popular, where people just read your t-shirt and get told off. You know, as a Christian, we shouldn't have any smart aleck t-shirts. We're to be like God. We're to be Christ-like. And we're not trying to tell people off. We're supposed to love the unlovable. So we don't want anyone to be told off by our clothes. Right? Um, I had a little t-shirt. I had two of them, a black one and a white one. And it had this little girl on there making a face, and she was plugging her ears. And the saying across the t-shirt was, it said, not listening. So when I wore those shirts, essentially... I was putting that smart aleck saying out there to anyone who read my shirt. And that's not godly, and that's not good fruit. That's not godly fruit. Stuff like this is all about Satan's kingdom. I used to have a vest with witches on it. You see that on the left, and I'm wearing it in that picture. And look how cute and sweet they are portrayed there, stirring their cauldrons. There isn't anything cute, sweet, or nice about a witch who was empowered by demons working for the kingdom of darkness. I wasn't really saved back then. Even though if you met me, I would have told you I was a Christian. I was living a very sinful life, walking around saying I was a Christian. I see that, I see that in America is so huge, very huge. We are to be fruit inspectors and check for the fruit. If anybody checked for the fruit, I didn't have any. My Bible was in a back room collecting dust. And I hadn't even read the Bible at that time, the whole Bible. So no, I was not a Christian. I did not love God's Word and was not feeding and growing on His Word every day. So no, we got to not just listen to the lip service of someone saying they're Christian. We got to look at their lives. We've got to look for that fruit. Right? Jesus said you will know them by their fruits. Okay? So, these were things I had when I was single, and I kept them. And I even discovered them packed away in storage not long ago. Kennedy and I were uh, going through and cleaning out some old clothes, and I found them. I still had them because I had packed them away years ago. Um, but got rid of them now. They got burnt up. The reason I didn't understand the wickedness of all of this, because I wasn't really saved, I wasn't reading God's Word, I did not know His stance on witches and witchcraft, and I did not understand the real meaning of witchcraft. We think it's just people doing tricks, you know, magic tricks and, and stuff. It's very deep what they do in witchcraft, what they're doing against us, like John Todd said when they market these products. They're doing rituals over them. They're putting spells and curses on these products. 
It comes from the head down, the one who founded the company in allegiance to Satan. Then everything that that company does is for Satan. And it is being used against us. We have to understand witchcraft, like Pastor Erustus had said when we were talking one time, it is deeper than we can even imagine the things that they are doing, how far it has advanced. So, all right. Witchcraft is idolatry against God. Idolatry is serving another God. Another God is a fallen angel. That is Satan and the fallen angels. That's what idolatry is. That's what witchcraft is. They seek a witch has no power but through a demon. Witches are empowered and work with demons. They have demons in them, and they summon and work with other demons. That's what witchcraft is. Throw out all pagan feast day clothing, like Christmas sweaters or sweatshirts, Halloween t-shirts, Christmas ties. We had all those things in our home. Uh, we had all that kind of stuff, and we got rid of it. Playing with or owning occult items like a Ouija board will connect you directly to the kingdom of darkness. It is an abominable thing, and it gives Satan a legal right to come into your life and your home. Notice the sun on the top left corner and the moon on the, and the star on the top right corner. The occult worship the fallen angels who are directly tied to the planets. And even in our Bibles, God warns us not to bow down to the sun, moon, and stars, which is idolatry. Or you could simply put, it's demon worship. That's what idolatry is. You could say demon worship. Satan is a sun god. Those that worship the sun, S-U-N, are actually worshiping him and not the ball of light that we see in the sky. We think how dumb that is that they worship that stuff, but they are actually worshiping the fallen angels who are tied to those planetary or planetary bodies. Look at this one, rare, 2008, Hasbro, pink Ouija, mystery, oracle, board game. Hasbro is one of the largest toys companies in America. The other Ouija board that we just saw was made by Parker Brothers. These mega corporations do not care about the well-being of your child. They just want to do their master's bidding and make money and introduce demons into your child's life. They know what these things do. Get rid of tarot cards and items used to tell or know the future, even if it is just supposedly a game. I see people doing this stuff online all the time. They've got a lot of little witchcraft, uh, little games and stuff on Facebook where uh, click here to know, you know, uh, who, who you're going to meet. Or click here to know how this is going to go in your life or whatever. All that stuff is like a softened down version of witchcraft. And, and then people just think it's cute to click on that stuff and share it on their profile and go along. And those are things from the kingdom of darkness. Even that, I don't do that stuff. It's a pass for me. It's like, no, I recognize, I know what that is. And we need to get just that serious about God and His Word in order to... You want to draw nearer to Him? You want to have more of His power in your life? Start getting serious about the stuff you're doing. About what you own, what you possess, what you believe, what you're looking at, what you're listening to. Get serious about it. Start looking at it spiritually. Okay, I want to talk about uh, some things in the yard because we're talking about the things that we own and possess and taking a good look at good inventory, right? Spiritually. So, you have to take a look at the things that are in your yard also. For example, a lot of people think garden gnomes are cute. Gnome. 
A gnome is a mythological creature and diminutive spirit in Renaissance magic and alchemy. Magic and alchemy. Introduced by Paracelsus in the 16th century and widely adopted by authors, including those of modern fantasy literature. And they try to, there's a disconnect when people hear mythological or they hear fantasy and they think, oh, this stuff isn't real. Oh, it's real. Those are the words that they use to dismiss the spirit realm, the kingdom of darkness, the evil side of the spirit realm. Again, a gnome is a demon. There are different types and levels of demons, just as there are different types and levels of holy angels. They are associated with witchcraft. And that's, you know, magic, and that's what magic and alchemy are, witchcraft. You don't want these things in your yard. They are drawing points for demons. It doesn't matter how cute Satan tries to dress it up or paint it or make it look how innocent looking it is. Now, uh, looking at this wicked thing, I know someone personally who claims to be a Christian, does not want to talk about God or his word, and has something almost just like this in their backyard. I was floored. This is an idol of a fallen angel, and it looks like Satan himself. It has wings on it. It's got horns. It has a mean, hateful face sticking its tongue out. This type of statue acts as an open portal, drawing demons into this realm. If you see this in a yard, one thing you know is that the people that live there have demons in their lives and in their home. For a fact. The demon statue uh, sticking out its tongue. Let's go to the Bible and see what the Bible says about that. Isaiah 57, 3 through 4. But draw near hither, you sons of the sorceress, the seed of the adulterer and the whore. Against whom do you sport yourselves? Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Are you not children of transgression? A seed of falsehood? Now, I want to look at that in the New Living Translation. But you, come here, you witches children, you offspring of adulterers and prostitutes. Whom do you mock, making faces and sticking out your tongues? You children of sinners and liars. Here we go. The sticking out of the tongue with those who serve Satan is about demonic possession. It is about being demonically talented and it is a way to give honor to the God they serve and also a way to mock God. Satan knows scripture and he has taught it to those that serve him. And even if they don't know because they're on the lower levels and all they know is they sold out for fame, fortune, and power and whatnot to be idolized, Satan knows God's word and he knows what he is having them do in honor and worship of him. So all in all, it drills back to Satan mocking God and using them, his little pawns, to do it. They are speaking to the brotherhood when they do this posing for pictures it's just a way of saying who they serve without saying a word and that without saying a word uh when god confused the languages they found a different way to speak satan found a way for his worshipers to speak and to acknowledge each other without saying anything and they do it through symbol magic their logos they do it through uh color magic, the colors that they choose for their corporations and different products. They do it through number magic. They do it with their, uh, how they do their hands, uh, you know, the 666 and different things. They do it with their facial expressions. They are speaking to the brotherhood and they're not having to say anything, but yet they are saying something. They are the children of witches, of sinners, 
and liars. They have been raised, groomed, and programmed to be against God. In closing, be mindful of what is in your yard and your home, what you have spent your money on. I've shared a lot of things we had in our own home and the things that, and also I've shared things that the Holy Spirit has brought to my mind along the way. We were the typical American family and look at all the filth that we had in our lives, in our home. We had so many bags of trash and things that were, you know, broken, destroyed, burned, that we got rid of, that we got out of the house. There are even more things than the things that I have revealed that I could, you know, talk about if I think about the things that other people have bought, which the Holy Spirit has, you know, helped me to think of some things that other people have been doing and that they have and to teach on those things. But, you know, this could just go on and on. But I've tried to give you a pretty good and clear idea how to look at the things in your home, test it spiritually, look at it, you know, based on Scripture, you know, pray and ask God if you're unsure about something. Really look at what's in your home and get down to the real meaning of it. What does it mean? We need to cleanse our houses physically. But we're doing it spiritually because we belong to Jesus. As Christians, we are not to have things in our home that directly connect us to Satan's kingdom. We are not to have things in our home and possession that God considers abominable. I want to go to Matthew 10, 16. Jesus said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We're supposed to understand how the enemy is working in this world and yet avoid the things that please him, Satan, and that open doors to him and his demons in our lives. We don't want to open ourselves up to Satan. Okay, he's always going to be fighting us and attacking us and shooting those fiery darts. But we certainly don't want to open the door and welcome him in. Come on in here and tear me down right, right on the inside, right? We don't want to do that. We are to be holy for God is holy. Really look through the things in your home with your spiritual eyes and get down to the meaning of what you own and get rid of all the ungodly things. Ask God to show you anything in your home that does not please Him. And He will. He will get busy and go to town. Because I'm telling you, I'm sure, you know, the Holy Spirit, it's like we have to learn. We're all in school, right? We're being taught by the Holy Spirit. And we, you know, he's always working to clean us up. And the Bible, it's pruning us, right? And it never feels good. You know, just like Scott was saying when he saw all the movies, you know, that we had bagged up and we got rid of or all the Christmas stuff. And when we're just sitting there doing the math, it's just like cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Look at all that money we spent on all of that, right? But um, um, I praise God that the Holy Spirit pointed it out. And we got busy obeying quickly. So, uh, he will show you uh, the things in your home that need to go, that need to be dealt with. Repent for having bought those things. Spending what God has blessed you with on ungodly things. Repent for the ungodly things you've owned and participated in and ask God to cleanse your life from all of it to cleanse your home, to cleanse your children's lives. You know, we're the ones buying the toys for them, right? So that, that's going to fall back on us, okay? Uh, ask him to cleanse your life, your home, your children's lives from any demons or demonic attachments that entered your life, your home, your child's lives because of the ungodly things that you had, because of what was in your home. If you were a witch or in the occult, 
destroy all occult items. So and that goes for anybody, right? Destroy all occult items. There are people now who aren't even necessarily witches who have occult things in their homes. That's, that's how good a job Satan has done on this world, okay? Destroy all occult items, repent, and ask God for forgiveness. Cover yourself in Jesus' blood. That is for everyone. And you can administer self-deliverance because those in the occult for sure need deliverance. That covers what, what, how far I'm going to go and talk about cleaning your physical house and life, your yard, taking a look at things and getting it out. Pray and ask God to show you the things in your life that do not please Him, and He will. Okay? He answers our prayers. So, with that said, let's go to prayer, you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for all the things that you revealed to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, God himself living inside of us. I magnify you, Heavenly Father. You are high and lifted up. You are the one true and living God. You are I am that I am. And you are holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And dear Lord Jesus, you are our Redeemer. You're our High Priest, our Mediator. You're our Savior, Lord and King, those of us who are truly saved. I thank you, dear, dear Lord Jesus, for shedding your holy and precious blood to redeem us from the hand of the devil so that our sins could be forgiven. Thank you for breaking the yoke of bondage that Satan had on our necks and lives. I praise you, Lord Jesus. You are King of kings and Lord of all lords. I magnify you, Lord Jesus. You're the one. You're the deliverer. Salvation comes through you and you alone. And dear Holy Spirit, you are the power who raised Christ from the dead. You're the power of God, the power of Christ. You're the excellent, the perfect, the complete spirit. I praise you, dear Holy Spirit. I magnify you. And I pray that you will please help us to get the things that don't please you out of our lives. Please show us, Holy Spirit. I pray that you will speak to each one listening and show them what is in their homes, what's in their yards, what do they have that does not please God and help them to destroy it, to ask forgiveness, to repent and don't bring any of that kind of stuff back in. I pray that you would help each one who has young children in the home. And even those that, you know, grown children, you can still, uh, you know, sow seeds to them and share things to them about what's connecting their lives to the kingdom of darkness. I pray, dear Holy Spirit, that you would help us as parents who have children to teach them. And if they've gone away from home, to still speak into their lives godly things, to keep sowing those godly seeds into their lives, to be a witness for Christ, to let them know the truth. That's what's going to set them free. Please help us, dear Holy Spirit, to minister to our own children in our own homes about why we don't buy this or why we don't have that or why we have to get rid of this or that toy, what it really means spiritually. Please help us to be more spiritually minded, to understand the spirit realm better. Please help us to know how the enemy operates, what he's doing in this world, and to recognize him and his influence and to avoid evil and temptations in our lives. Please help us to do exactly what Jesus said, to watch and pray that we enter not into temptation. Please help us to be vigilant over our homes and our families and our children. We want to live lives that please God. Help us, dear Holy Spirit, in all that we do to live to please the Lord, to be more like Jesus every day. Please mold us and shape us, Heavenly Father. You are the potter and we are the clay. We want everything that we have. Everything that pertains to us physically and spiritually, we want it all under your umbrella of protection and blessing. 
We don't want to have sin in the camp like Achan did. And he brought sin on all of Israel so that you didn't fight for them and didn't protect them. Let that minister to us, Father, because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I thank you for all the things that you've put your finger on as, as those who have listened to these sermons have been taken in account of what's in their home. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for helping to deliver us more and more as we learn and grow in the faith. And dear Holy Spirit, I want to lift up the family and friends of Barbara. She just passed away. We've been praying for her to be healed. And it was a hard situation. Some things, some complications happened uh, in the hospital. And she, she, she wasn't coming back from those things. But Lord, we know that your plan for her life was fulfilled. And we just lift up her family and friends to you now. I lift up her husband and her children and those who loved her and her really missing her and their hearts are broken and torn apart, grieving that she's gone, that she's out of, out of their lives for right now, that she's left this world. But we know that they'll see her again. So Lord... Dear Holy Spirit, I pray that you would comfort them. Please give them peace. Please give them strength through the next days and weeks and months ahead. It's going to be so hard for them. Please comfort them and strengthen them. And I pray that you would pour your love out in their hearts and lives. I pray that you would love on them, dear Holy Spirit. Please help them through the funeral service. We just lift up her family and friends to you those that uh, went to church with her. Her husband is a pastor serving on your altar, Lord. I pray that you will give him strength. Lord, I just lift, uh, lift them up to you, and I pray that those that she knew and loved, we pray for their salvation. Heavenly Father, we pray that they would all have their lives right with you. We pray that they would truly be saved so that they will have the gift of eternal life. We just lift them up to you, Lord, and we lift our family and friends up, and we pray that you would comfort and strengthen them in every way. And I pray, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would keep your hedge of protection and your wall of fire around the flock entrusted to me. I cover them in the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that you keep us protected on every side. Lord, I pray that you would bless them and keep them. And please make your face to shine upon them. Please be gracious unto them. I pray, Lord, that you lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace. Please bless them and prosper them in every way, Heavenly Father. I thank you for the flock you've entrusted to me. Thank you so much for them, Lord. And I want to lift up to you, Heavenly Father, the cheerful givers. I lift up those that pray sincere prayers over this ministry and all the prayer requests and me and my family and the outreach ministries, those who share the sermons, those who are encouragers, those who really stand with us, Father. I pray that you would press it down, shake together, and let their cups overflow, blessing back to them what they have done, first of all, for your kingdom, honor, and glory, and also for me and my family and for this ministry. I pray, Father, that you bless them abundantly and prosper them in every way. Please bless and multiply their incomes. Lord, please help all of us to meet, to be able to pay our bills. Help us all to make wise financial decisions, to live righteously before you, Father, and seek your kingdom first so all our needs will be met. Please help us, Heavenly Father, through this nasty, wicked, filthy world. Such a fallen world now, Father. Please help us, your children, to endure and to persevere until we go to be with Jesus. 
And I pray, dear Holy Spirit, for the body of Christ at large. I pray, dear Holy Spirit, that you would equip all of us and help us to run a strong race, to finish our races well. We, each one of us, want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Please help us to know what our gifts and talents are and to, and to get busy using them for God's glory. Please help us to get rooted and grounded in the faith and to grow up in the faith, to have an unwavering, unshakable faith. Please strengthen us and help us to endure until we go to be with Jesus. And please help us to live our lives in such a way that even if it was today that we are ready to go and be with Jesus, whether we live to the rapture or our, our time comes and God calls us home, please help us to live ready to go and be with Jesus. Please strengthen us and equip us and help us to wear the full armor of God. Help us to live obedient, righteous lives, dear Holy Spirit. Please give each one of us a zeal to read God's Word and to pray daily, to cultivate that intimate relationship with God through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Please help us to keep standing no matter what happens. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight to serve God in spirit and in truth. Please teach us, dear Holy Spirit. And I pray that uh, you would give all of us teachable spirits Please open our spiritual eyes, ears, and understanding. Please help us to understand God's Word and to apply it to our lives, to be doers of God's Word and not hearers only. Help us to hide His Word deep down in our hearts that we might not sin against God. And I praise you all in Trinity, dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord Jesus, dear Holy Spirit. I love you because you first loved me. And I magnify you. Thank you for hearing and answering this prayer. And I pray and ask it all in your beloved and only begotten Son's name. In Christ Jesus of Nazareth's name I pray. Hey you guys. I just want to take a minute to um, let's go through how to pray the prayer of salvation. Okay. And why? Why do we even need to pray the prayer of salvation? Okay. And also I'm talking to the people also who maybe walked with the Lord and you went away from him and you just kind of left it behind and you haven't really been walking with Jesus anymore. Um, that's what we call backsliders. I'm talking to both the person who wants to be saved for the first time ever and to the person who's a backslider who wants to come back to Jesus because this ministry does not believe in once saved, always saved. Okay, God does his part and we do our part. It's a team. We work together. All right, so the first thing is you might say, and I hear this a lot, and even my husband was saying it, to be honest with you, before we got truly saved. I'm a good person. You know, I haven't killed anybody. That's kind of the standard these days. As long as you haven't killed anybody, you're a good person. Really, listen to this. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. All of us have sinned. To be honest with you, because the world is in a fallen state, we all are born into sin, okay? And also for the people that think, but I'm a good person. I'm good. I haven't hurt. I don't hurt nobody. I do good things. I help people. That, that person, then uh, there's scripture in Isaiah that says for our righteousness, that's when we're calling ourselves good and we're saying, but we're good. We're good people. Our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. That's that thing that thinks that you're like, ooh, get it out of the house, right? Filthy rags to him. Okay, and he's the standard. He's the judge, Jesus Christ. And so the thing is, if we don't, if we miss his mark and we don't please him, we're not going to make heaven. So we want to make sure we got our ducks all in a row, right? And uh, if you look at the Ten Commandments, now we're not a legalistic church. We know we're under grace, which is what Jesus Christ brought. But there's people that say, you know, like I don't need Jesus. I'm, I'm doing the Ten Commandments. Well, if you just pull out the simplest one, I'm just going to pull out one. You shall not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, okay? That's what lying is. And if you say, I, oh, I don't lie. That's a lie. 
Everybody lies. Little kids come out lying. You say, did you do that? Did you break this? No, not me. Bam. So come on, you know. Um, so here's the thing. We've all broken uh, at least one of the commandments. And in the New Testament, it says if you break one, you broke them all. Because that's the attitude of God. He's like, if you break one, it's just as good as breaking them all. Because that's all it takes to separate you from him as one. Okay? So let's pray that prayer of salvation. It's real easy to do, y'all. You just say, dear Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins. Please come into my heart. I believe you died on that cross for me, and I believe you rose again, and you are seated at God's right hand. Please help me to live for you all the days of my life, and thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Now, that prayer, you prayed to Jesus in his name. The rest of them, you're going to pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Okay, and you'll get all that as you learn and grow in the Spirit. Okay, um, to see why you needed to pray that prayer of salvation, the scripture on that is Romans 10, 9 and 10. That'll show you about confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart and, and how to obtain salvation in case you're wondering how come we're doing that, okay? Um, now, something that you're going to want to do, you want to right off the bat start establishing your relationship with Jesus. Okay, and in order to do that, you want to hear his voice, right? You want to hear him. I don't know a person out there that's trying to be a Christian that doesn't want to hear his voice. And how you hear his voice? Read his word. That's his words written down for you and I to read. That's his voice speaking to you without a shadow of a doubt. Okay, then when you pray, you speak to him. So what's that? That's two-way communication. You're speaking to him. He's speaking to you. Now you've got a relationship going, okay? And you want to do that every day. Every day, seek him. You seek him by reading his word and praying and letting him know, I want more of you. When you read the Bible, ask him to open your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears and to give you understanding. And he'll help you understand his word, okay? He wrote it by Holy Spirit, okay? And the next thing that you're going to want to do is get in a good Bible-based church. Now, I'm not pushing any kind of denomination. You just want to find a church that is preaching and teaching the whole Bible. Okay? They believe in the Bible, and they believe in Jesus Christ, that he is God and the Son of God. Okay? And that it's through him that we have our redemption and our salvation. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? And also, um, I wanted to say that some people think, oh, I just pray for forgiveness one time and I'm done because he died way back when. So now that I ask, it's all already done. No, you need to ask forgiveness and try to make it a habit on a daily basis because we're in these fleshly bodies before we get our glorified bodies. So we battle this flesh daily. So just, you know, when you pray each day at some point during the day, say, Lord, please forgive me for all my sins and go on about your prayer. And he knows you're praying and you're talking to him from your heart. And you talk to him just like you and I would talk, okay? You don't have to have fancy whatever, all right? And ask him to help you grow spiritually. If you want to, let us know that you prayed that prayer. It would be such a blessing to hear your testimony, okay? God bless y'all.